Welcome, my, my name is Grace Hayek. I'm with the Glencoe Public Library and um, I'd like to introduce today's uh, presenter for our program, Mr. Tom Tiddens. Mr. Tiddens has worked at the Chicago Botanic Garden in the Plant Health Care Department for 25 years. Under his supervision, the department has significantly reduced its use of fertilizers and pesticides. His primary duties involve protecting the garden's plant collections from diseases, pests, and weeds in, in an environmentally sensitive manner. Mr. Tiddens is a certified arborist through the International Society of Arboriculture and serves as the garden's lead arborist in managing tree care and risk assessment. He's also the containment director for the Butterflies and Blooms exhibition and is responsible for butterfly health and management as well as the permitting process through the USDA. In addition, he's the garden's representative in the Sentinel Plant Network, which unifies botanic gardens in an effort to monitor for and provide education on high consequence pests and pathogens that threatens, threaten the nation's flora, agricultural crops, and ornamental plants. Um, I'm going to let you take it away now, Mr. Tiddens. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Okay, thank you, Grace. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, uh, to speak to you all today about uh, lawn care. And also thank you to uh, Glencoe and the Glencoe Public Library. Um, uh, I've, I've worked at the Chicago Botanic Garden 25 plus years and uh, pretty much all in the Department of, of Plant Health Care. And one of my responsibilities has been taking care of the lawn at, 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 at the garden and doing it in such a way that uh, uh, we're being try, trying to be in, environmentally conscious and being careful about our, our inputs that uh, affect the environment. And we're going to talk about some of that, that today. Uh, but before I, before I delve in, I just want to invite all of you to come out to the Chicago Botanic Garden. Uh, we are open, but you need to make a, a timed uh, reservation on our website to come and visit us. But I think with all that's going on, the Botanic Garden is a wonderful respite for people to come out and enjoy and walk around and visit, visit the garden. So please come and visit us and uh, especially this spring, come and see how our lawn is doing that we're gonna talk about today. And uh, the talk I'm doing today is real similar to one that I've done over the years. I've done it for the Chicago Flower and Garden Show a, a number of times. And I used to call it Lawn Care Simplified. Um, environmentally friendly lawn care has been another name, but I think people make lawn care into uh, being a lot more difficult than it needs to be to be, and are also applying a lot more products than I think we really need to be need to and introducing them into the environment. So I'm going to talk about simplifying and decreasing our use of uh, synthetic fertilizers and synthetic uh, uh, herbicides as well, not excluding them, but greatly reducing the, um, the amount. Um, all right, lawns have a lot of different purposes, a uh, home lawn, athletic fields uh, of different types and certainly used for recreation. And here at Botanic Garden, I kind of think of our lawns as kind of the picture frame for our, our collections. We don't encourage people to really lounge on the, the lawn at all, like in this picture here. But really, I think a lawn is an important component of, of, a, of a landscape that has a, a, lot, of, a lot of uses. And uh, uh, I know we all have our beloved Wrigley Field, which is one of the most pristine lawns in our area, and it's just uh, oh, just restful to even 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 look at. Uh, but for us as homeowners, uh, uh, I have my own home lawn, and uh, whoever's taking care of this one here is certainly doing a nice job. Uh, really nice color, uh, very uniform in look. Uh, I don't see a single weed to be found, so they're certainly spending a good bit of time on their lawn. And I think lawn, as far as weeds or not, it's kind of up to your expectation and what you think you want your lawn to be. My lawn at home certainly isn't weed free, but it's not a total weed disaster like this, this lawn here. And uh, I think whoever has this lawn has really been not doing anything. It looks like new construction. Maybe maybe the soil maybe the soils are really poor here. I can also tell that their neighbor here probably is a lawn care company, not a weed to be found. And then if we look over the other way, you can see uh, there's their yard and there's the there's the neighbors. So this is getting a little bit little bit out out of out of hand, and we probably want to get this under under control. And uh, it could be as simple as uh, making a few changes in the way they're caring for their lawn. Uh, could make a great, great effect. Maybe they're mowing too short. Uh, maybe they haven't been fertilizing this lawn. Maybe you could use some core aeration that we're going to talk about some of these cultural things or things we do to the lawn that can make it more vigorous and help decrease the amount of weeds uh, and not being having to rely on a, on, on a, on a spray. 
but I think we can have a lot nicer lawn than this with, with, uh, with without a lot of lot of input. Um, so I want to talk about some of the different lawn care approaches uh, that we might have, and I think the most uh, uh, kind of the, the one we, a lot of people do is just really do nothing other than just kind of mow your lawn, and you're going to get the, a, could end up with a weedy lawn and uh, probably not be loved by your neighbor. So I think you need to do. Uh, a little bit of focus on on uh, managing the weeds and keeping your lawn look looking nice to be a good part of part of the community. Um, there's the kind of the conventional approach, and I know a lot of people will hire a landscape company and they'll come in and they will spray your lawn one time, two times, three times, and sometimes even four times. And when they come and spray your lawn, they're spraying corner to corner, edge to edge. So when they leave your property, they've pretty much cleaned up all the weeds, but they are putting spraying a lot lot of herbicide. And a lot that's really unnecessary. Are weeds on 100% of your lawn? Uh, probably not. Uh, and there's a way we can kind of get around that. And also, in a conventional approach, uh, uh, there's probably fertilizing at least three to four times a year, and most likely using a synthetic fertilizer. Um, and I think we can get away from that and still have a nice lawn. So uh, uh, we need to do something, but the conventional spray, spray, spray approach, I think we should be getting away from. And Today I'm going to focus on an approach that's uh, I kind of call the integrated approach. It's kind of uh, differentiates between an organic approach and a conventional approach, with a strong focus on something we call cultural care. And I'm going to bring this term up a few times this morning or this afternoon. And cultural care—that just means cultural means kind of the things how what we do in caring for our lawn, uh, how we mow our lawn, which I'm going to talk about in, in depth. That has a huge impact on the quality of our lawn. Um, uh, are, we, are we possibly, are we core aerating? It could have another influence on our lawn. Uh, fertilization, whether we're fertilizing or not, and even what type of fertilizer we're, we're, we're using. Um, all these things have an influence on, on your lawn. So when I talk about an integrated approach, uh, we're probably gonna do very, very, very little spraying and we will fertilize, but we'll probably use an organic fertilizer. Um, but if you wanted to go all organic, very much like the integrated approach, we're gonna focus on cultural care, but we would not be using any synthetic uh, herbicides uh, or any synthetic fertilizers. And you're gonna end up with an organic approach uh, having a semi-weedy lawn, but it won't be, won't be as horrible as that picture I showed you just a, a little bit ago. But we'll kind of dig into this a little more as we kind of move on here this afternoon. Um, uh, so the integrated approach, sometimes called uh, integrated pest management or plant health care, these are just uh, uh, philosophies for maintaining uh, uh, plants in the landscape. And my title used to be IPM supervisor. Now I'm PHC plant healthcare supervisor. And again, these are just two approaches to uh, uh, landscape maintenance that uh, focuses on uh, the, the, the environment and being, being sensitive. And a, a goal in this program is to, for us and as far as maintaining a lawn in an integrated fashion would be uh, you're striving to have a very strong, vigorous lawn. And a strong, vigorous lawn, believe it or not, will outcompete weeds and at the same time be very, very resistant to insect and disease attack. So, this is our goal that we're going to keep in mind as we talk uh, this afternoon developing a very strong, vigorous lawn. Uh, and if we can do that, we will actually start to outcompete the weeds and you won't have a lot of problems. But we need to be sure. Uh, to be successful in this, that we are doing all of our cultural things uh, uh, proper and really proper maintenance. And we're going to kind of go into that right now and talk about some of the things that we think are really simple, but there's a little bit more to them than, than, than you would think. And really, when you're thinking about your lawn, um, it's uh, all the same plant, but uh, there are millions of grass plants uh, and kind of think of them as like a million perennial plants and how would I, how would I care for them? How can I care for them so they're in very good vigor and doing as well? Because if I can get this lawn here to be very thick and vigorous, uh, a, a germinating weed seed won't have a chance, uh, uh, but it's, it's uh, kind of a difficult proposition, but we can, we can get there if we do, do things right. And a lot of it uh, involves actually simplifying some of the things we're doing. So, but some considerations really up front uh, to be successful. We need to make sure that we have enough light to grow a lawn successfully. So a lot of times when I do consultation, I'll go to someone's lawn and there's like, I'm having trouble. I've got a weed problem here. I keep having to recede every year. And, but they're trying to grow a lawn under a very dense uh, uh, maple tree. 
and it's just not going to work. There are situations where you're just not going to be able to grow a lawn successful. Uh, really, even the shady tolerant uh, types of lawn really require at least a half day of sun to do well. So if you're struggling with trying to grow a lawn under a maple tree, maybe it's time to give up, make a nice mulch circle around the tree and put wood chips or a ground cover under rather than fighting this losing battle kind of forever. So we need to make sure we've got enough light for the lawn to grow. And generally we need at least a half day of sunlight for a lawn to be su successful. Because uh, again, our, remember our goal is to have a lawn that's so vigorous that it's gonna fill in and out compete the weeds. And if it doesn't have enough sun, it's certainly not going to do that. Also, your lawn needs uh, an adequate amount of good soil that's really not compacted. And sadly, when new homes are built, a lot of times they will strip all the good soil, build the home, and then right at the end, they'll throw sod down on top of uh, a very poorly prepped area. So we really need to have six to eight inches of good uh, topsoil to grow our lawn well. But there are things we can do to help kind of invigorate uh, a lawn that's heavily compacted and doesn't have the best soils. And we'll talk about something called core aeration in just a, a little bit as well. That's the way we can kind of uh, help help out a, a very uh, uh, a lawn that's growing in very poor poor heavy soils. And I think another thing that's in consideration is uh, what type of lawn do you have? What type of grass are you growing? I, a lot of times I'm doing it for a class and I say, okay, how many people know what type of lawn are growing? And majority of people go, I just know I have grass growing. I don't know what type. So we should really kind of know what type of lawn you're growing. So if you need to go and buy seed, uh, you know what type to get. But I'll say in general, most of the lawns in the Chicagoland area are, uh, are, are bluegrass lawns. And actually here at the Chicago Botanic Garden, probably 75% of our lawns are, are bluegrass lawns. And when I say bluegrass, it's not always just 100% bluegrass. Generally a bluegrass lawn will be in combination with uh, perennial ryegrass as well. These two go in combination. And that's what this lawn here is in our rose garden. This is probably the most common lawn uh, in the Chicagoland area. And if you were to just go and buy a bag of seed, most likely these would be the two uh, types of seed you'd have in the mix. Other types of lawn that can be grown in our area, we can grow some uh, tall fescue lawns in our area, very coarse grass, um, not really great under the, the feet. So, the so, so coarse, I'll show you a picture of some of that in a little bit. Also, we've got some of the different types of fescue. These are more fine fescues. And when you buy a, a shady mix to, to grow in a section of your yard that's a little bit more shady, it would have a combination uh, of, of these sort of fescues in it. Bent grass is what we're gonna see growing at the golf courses. Very high maintenance, very difficult to work with and prone to a lot of problems. And actually golf courses actually create a lot of their own problems by using uh, this type of, of grass and also by mowing very short. And we're gonna talk about uh, the sins of mowing a lawn very, very, very short. So if you're not sure what kind of lawn, most likely you have a bluegrass lawn in, in your home. Uh, but if you're not sure, you can always uh, try and ID it. And there are keys online you can go to where you can look at uh, your grass blade and it'll take you through a series of questions and you figure out what type of grass you actually have, have, have growing. Um, so some of the some of the cultural things that, that I've been mentioning, really mowing, and we're going to talk about mowing and the importance of, of mowing in just a moment. Another uh, cultural care item is fertilization, and we're going to talk about fertilization, whether you decide to fertilize or not, and what type of fertilizer you choose, and we're going to be favoring uh, today to talk about some of the organic fertilizers, because uh, the, the, they have a lot of attributes to really helping your, your lawn, lawn do well. Uh, core aeration will help us with compaction, and we have not the best uh, soils for our lawn to grow in. Uh, we'll talk about watering, to water or not to water and how much to do per, per week and to, how it's important not to bounce back and forth from not watering to watering and uh, the negatives of frequent light watering. Uh, monitoring, I think is real important uh, even for, uh, not just for your lawn, but even for your home landscape that you like once a week go out, walk around your lawn, Take a look and see how it's how it's doing. Think about the uh, oh, did we have rain or not? Uh, when's the last time I mowed? And so, if you see any changes happening, you can kind of note them and uh, kind of have a have a thought in your mind as to when this started to happen. Is it a relationship to drought, uh, hot weather? Uh, so, getting out and just kind of looking at your lawn, I think, is real important. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, well, let's first start by talking about mowing. Seems like the simplest thing, but it's just so important for your lawn to get, get this right. Um, <clears throat> mow at the correct height. Um, do not scalp. 
And uh, I'm going to suggest we always mow at kind of a, a high mowing height uh, here at the Botanic Garden. We're, uh, we're at between three and a quarter and three and a half inches. And uh, I think that's what you should be doing for your home lawn as well. And a lot of times our settings uh, on the wheels where you have setting one, two, three, four might be related in inches. Well, what we like to do is put our lawnmower on pavement and measure from the pavement, not just to the bottom of the deck, but underneath the deck to where the blade first hits. And we'd like to be have that about three and a half inches. So we wanna mow on the high side. And why do we wanna mow with the high side rather than mowing short? Everyone thinks if I mow a little shorter, it's gonna look tidier. If I mow a little shorter, I won't have to mow as often. And those are kind of mis misconceptions because uh, I really suggest mowing on a weekly basis. But by mowing higher, it's going to really have some positives on your on your lawn. By mowing higher, um, you're going to be actually per, per, uh, providing more uh, shade and cooling to the soil, and helping keep it keeping it moist better and lessening lessening the, the drying out. Uh, by having it higher, <clears throat> you're going to have more grass blade showing, and the more grass blade showing is the more more photosynthesizing that will be happening to help create food for the grass plant. Uh, by mowing a little bit higher, you're actually going to help uh, uh, push the roots to become a little bit deeper. There is that relationship as well. So there are really great benefits to mowing on, on the high side. And uh, you're, you're going to be kind of mowing and really kind of stick with the, the weekly mowing routine. Uh, when you do get, uh, say, droughty, um, then we can back off on mowing a little bit, but kind of stick with the weekly mowing. Uh, and then let's go on the high side. And I, I bet everyone's probably mowing it more like two, two and a half inches. Let's bring that up to about three and a half inches. That alone can have a great impact on your lawn right away. It will start looking nicer and you will probably uh, see a decrease in weeds because the lawn will actually start to get thicker. So that's probably the number one thing with, 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 uh, with mowing is to change that height. Um, a second thing would be to jumping up top here would be use a mulching mower. There's no reason to be collecting all of your clippings and sending them to the landfill. Um, grass clippings are uh, approximately 80% water. Uh, so that when it dries out, it almost dis disappears. A mulching mower will take the grass blade up into, into it and will cut it not once, but multiple times into smaller pieces. Then it'll drop it right down and it will actually then kind of uh, degrade and actually help fertilize your lawn. They say by returning the lawn clippings to your lawn, you can cut back on your need for fertility by 20% uh, uh, or, or, or more. I know at home, I don't fertilize, but I use a mulching mower and uh, I return all the clippings to the lawn. Uh, I, I really need to stick with the weekly mowing because you don't want it to get too long long when you're using a mulching mower. So you really need to stick with that weekly, weekly mow. Uh, and also it, it saves me time too. I watch my neighbor across the street, Bob, who's really into uh, having a really high manicured lawn. He spends uh, almost his entire Sunday every week on his lawn. Uh, he bags everything. He ends up with about uh, uh, five garbage cans full every, every week. And he spends, uh, I would say a minimum of three hours on his lawn each week. I'm the botanic garden guy and I go out and I'm done with my lawn in less than 40 minutes. And I just use the mulching mower and go over it weekly. So I really think a mulching mower is the way to go. Let's get that mowing height brought up. Um, something else that's really important is having a nice uh, sharp blade on, on, on your mower. Uh, you can have a blade that's as, as dull as a butter knife and you'll, believe it or not, you'll still cut your lawn. But look at the ends of the grass blades you've cut and they're all frayed and they tend to yellow very, very quickly. Um, so I really think you should start each season with a fresh blade. Uh, if you have a larger lawn, you're doing a bit of mowing mid-season, put, put on a new sharp blade and that should get you through the season. And you can take uh, blades uh, somewhere to have them sharpened professionally for you. Uh, actually, it's not too hard to do yourself, but you need to be really careful. And also keeping that blade very balanced is real important as well. So maybe best to take it to a home center to uh, have that blade sharpened. But having a nice sharp blade and making that really nice clean cut on the lawn will actually help uh, uh, make it look a, a lot nicer. As I mentioned, we'll stick with the uh, try and mow weekly. You can cut back when we get, we get droughty, uh, but mowing on the high side uh, doesn't mean you're going to mow more often. You're going to kind of stick with that weekly, weekly mow. Um, 
And one thing I think is important to mow in different patterns. If you mow in the same pattern every week, you're going to start to develop ruts and kind of grooves. So here at the garden, our, our regime is week one will go one direction. Week two will go the opposite direction. Week three will go diagonal. Week four will go diagonal the other way. Then week five, we start the rotation again. And actually, it's kind of interesting. One week's a pattern will hold through till the second week. And sometimes you can get a little bit of a checkerboard appearance and it can actually look kind of cool too. So uh, by changing that pattern, you can kind of get this little bit of checkerboarding. And my wife always jokes with me whenever I'm getting ready to have company over, she knows uh, I do the lawn in the diagonal because I think it makes it look a little, 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 little nicer. So uh, whenever we're having company, I always kind of change that. Otherwise, I hate to say it, I'm kind of a, a lazy mower. I kind of sometimes end up getting caught in that kind of circular method, which isn't the greatest thing too, if I do that the same way every week. So change your patterns. It can really make, make a, a difference. And then also when, when mowing, uh, if we've just had a rain or it's real wet, just do not mow, wait till it dries out. Um, by mowing when it's wet, you're gonna be messing up your mower, you're gonna get clumping, especially with a mulching mower, you really need to have the lawn dry. Um, and then also with the wet conditions, there's a chance you could spread uh, spread disease. So uh, really if, if, we're, if we're, we're wet, uh, kind of hold off and, and uh, maybe wait, wait, till mowing, wait till mowing the afternoon or wait one, one, one day. Don't let your lawn get really long and try and do catch up. If by some chance you went on vacation, uh, you missed mowing for a week, don't come back and set it back, set it and go with the same setting. Actually set it even as high as you can go. And then rather than waiting a week, maybe wait three and five, three to five days and then then mow it again to get yourself back in the proper, proper mowing regime. But uh, a mowing, very simple, but it can have a huge impact on your lawn. So let's use a mulching mower. Let's set that height high. Let's have a sharp blade. Let's keep up with the weekly mowings. This alone can have a great impact on, 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 on your lawn. And this is one of the cultural things that we're talking about uh, uh, that certainly don't, don't, does not involve uh, any synthetic herbicides or, or, or fertilizers. Um, now that kind of leads us right into fertilization. And a bluegrass lawn to do real well does require some fertilization. And you kind of need to decide in your mind uh, whether you want to fertilize just once a year or whether you want to go full Monty, which would be three to four times. I wouldn't suggest any more than three. Um, uh, and actually in my home lawn, I don't fertilize at all. But remember I was saying about using the multi mower, I return all the clippings and the lawn's doing real well. The more you fertilize, the more the lawn grows as well, which means sometimes you may even need to mow, mow more often. Um, but when choosing a fertilizer, it gets very confusing at the home center. Uh, here's a fertilizer with uh, crabgrass pre-emergent, fertilizer with uh, uh, a weed killer, lawn food, fall lawn food. And this is one of those you hear about in the four step programs. Uh, they, they do work, but I really think uh, weed control and fertilization should be handled separately and not use these combination products. Um, this one is actually a fertilizer to use in the spring that has a pre-emergent for crabgrass. Yeah, that'll actually be, be effective. And if you have a serious crabgrass problem, you may want to consider doing that, but you can also deal with crabgrass on, on its own. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Weed and feed, this is a fertilizer that has a broadleaf weed uh, uh, killer in it or herbicide. I do not recommend these at all. You get them into your flower beds, you're going to have problems and they're just not very effective compared to a liquid spray that we'll talk about in just a little bit. I really think you just choose a one fertilizer and you'll use it either one, two or three times. And as far as timing for fertilization, if you want to go full Monty and fertilize, I'd suggest mid-May, late August and a third application around Halloween. Uh, if you wanted to pick just one time to do just one fertilization for the year, actually, it would be uh, uh, you you'd do that probably sometime in early October. Uh, that's that seems to be one of the op most opportune times, and it actually seems odd to do it that time of year, but it, it really helps set up your lawn for the more so thinking of the of the of the next next year. Um, and when picking a fertilizer, there's a lot on the market now, a lot of different types of organic fertilizers. And organic fertilizers are made from organic sources like this, this one here, the Nature Safe Feather Meal, Bone Meal. It's actually a lot of byproducts from other industries that are all natural products. A little bit slow in working, uh, very forgiving as far as you're not going to have burn. Some of them can be very expensive. Um, here's one that we use here at the Botanic Garden called Melorganite. 
It's actually made from sewage sludge, but very highly refined. And this is actually relatively not real expensive. It has an analysis. We'll talk about analysis in just a minute. This is a 1028. Uh, Milorganite is a 620. And actually, uh, with our soil types, this is actually a pretty good fertilizer for this. And I think this would be uh, very good for a home lawn. But there's a lot of different choices in or organic fertilizers. Um, here at the garden, this is a, a custom blend I have made for us, but I want to talk about these three numbers here that you're going to find on a fertilizer bag. All the fertilizer bags are going to have these three numbers on it. This is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Our soils tend to be very high in phosphorus and potassium, so these two numbers can be very low. This middle number, phosphorus, is uh, very, very adequate in our soils, as I just mentioned, but uh, this one tends to leach readily and is very notorious for getting into uh, lakes and causing algae blooms and being a big pollutant. And actually landscape companies in Illinois are not allowed to have any phosphorus in their lawn mix unless it's from an organic source. Uh, so these two numbers on a bag, you're looking to be pretty small. This is the amount of nitrogen. Nitrogen is for green up and growth. Um, and then here, this bag is 18% nitrogen and uh, nitrogen in this bag, I've got three different sources. This one here is fast release, meaning 5.8% meaning of it with the first rain is gonna release real quick. So I'll get a big, uh, big quick green up water soluble nitrogen. The malorganite, uh, we actually have that malorganite product, 52% of the 50 pound bag is Malorganite, that's part of a blend I have made. This tends to be a, a medium slow release. And I do have another product in there called Neutraline. And this is an encapsulated uh, 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 fertilizer that has a lot of layers on it that as moisture and microbial activity happen on it, it will slowly release uh, fertilizer over a long period of time. Because we're only gonna be fertilizing at the most two or three times a year uh, and we really don't want to fertilize and have the first rain, big green up and then nothing. So some of these slow release nitrogens can help span that uh, two to three uh, plus month period to kind of keep us with a, a steady, steady green up. And then uh, also in the malorganite naturally comes uh, sulfur and iron and sulfur helps with our soil pH and iron is really great for green up. But again, I think for you all, maybe malorganite could be a a uh, choice of a fertilizer alone, but I just really want you to understand these three numbers, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and uh, that these two, we really are, are actually found about phosphorus, potassium on our soils at pretty high, high levels. Um, when fertilizing, if you choose, choose to fertilize, I recommend using a broadcast spreader. Fertilizer goes in the hopper. You can see the different colors here because we've got a blend of some different products in there of the different nitrogen sources. But a broadcast spreader will actually drop fertilizer through it, it'll hit a spinning pan that will fling it out in either way. And you'll go down one way, then you go like two spreader widths over, you'll do another pass and you'll get overlap. Very, very forgiving. There's other types of spreaders and I'll show you an example of it in a minute that are called drop spreaders. And if you don't hit your marks on rows really carefully, you're gonna streak your lawn. Um, really important to look at the fertilizer bag and set your spreader to the proper setting. More is not better for sure. Um, so it will say like uh, for what type of fertilizer spreader, this is a Lesco spreader, flip the bag over and it'll say for a Lesco spreader to set it to setting B or C and, and follow that. And that's a standardized amount that will come out then that will, if you're applying properly, will put down one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet with each, each application. Um, Here's just an area of this person was probably using a drop spreader. And I see this all too often, probably using a, a fertilizer that had quick release uh, nitrogen in it. So uh, all the nitrogen would release after the first rain. And basically uh, uh, neighbor Bob was probably fertilizing, did one pass, good, two pass, three pass, maybe got a cell phone call. Boy, moved over a little bit and didn't hit this one right either. Didn't hit this one right. Hit two stripes right there and then missed another gap. We had some rain. And then we get this dark green up in these streaks left. And this can be avoided if we use a broadcast spreader that kind of forgivingly throws it out in each row and you have your nice overlap. Uh, so I, I see this all, all too often where someone has uh, kind of made a mess of their lawn by uh, uh, not applying the fertilizer properly. It probably would have been better to do nothing, nothing at all. Um, so, so fertilization, again, I don't even fertilize my lawn at home and I look pretty darn good, but for a bluegrass lawn, you want it to look good anywhere from one fertilization per season up to about 
three uh, per season. I'm going to give you some resources at the end where you can get some more information on some of the things I've, I've talked about today. Um, core aeration um, is another cultural thing we can do to invigorate our lawn. And it's generally done once or twice per season. Uh, can be done late spring or very early fall, anytime that the lawn is in good vigor and not ready to go under stress. And what this machine does is it goes over your lawn and pulls cores about the size of your thumb going down about three to four inches. And uh, what it does is it decreases compaction, will increase the drainage uh, in, in, the, in the soil and loosen the, lessen the compaction, um, will actually increase the rooting. And if you have a thatch problem, and I'll show you a picture of what thatch is in a little bit, it'll help break, break the thatch layer. And aeration it would, we, was the way we deal with a thatch problem. Uh, and we do not really use uh, dethatchers any, 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 anymore. Um, question is always, do I need to do this, Tom? Is it really essential? And in most situations, it's gonna be very beneficial. Um, but if you have really good soils and you don't have a lot of activity on your lawn, I think you may not need to do this. So I suggest people go out uh, when your lawn is not, not like totally dry, take a pencil, hold the pencil on the lawn. And with one finger, if you can push the pencil down four, six inches, relatively easy, you probably don't need to aerate. But I bet most of you won't be able to do that. So uh, an aeration once or twice a year can really help out. You can rent one of these machines for uh, a little under $100 for a day. So maybe team up with some of your uh, neighbors to bring the, bring the cost down. I, I think you probably do three or four yards in, 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 in a day. Uh, so it uh, can really, really help out your, your lawn if uh, your lawn is thinning and you think uh, compaction might be part of the problem. And like that first lawn I showed you with all the dandelions, I think they had a soil problem that would very much benefit from having their lawn aerated for, for a few years or maybe indefinitely. Watering. Okay, we get some really good dry spells in, in, in our area. And uh, the bluegrass lawn that we've been talking about, it can actually uh, be allowed to go into a, a sort of a, a dormant state. So when we get start to get droughty, if you don't water, uh, don't worry, it can go brown. And then when we start having rains again, it'll come back and probably be just fine. Uh, it does stress it out a little bit. It doesn't give an opportunity for weeds to kind of jump in, uh, but we, we, can, we can get away without watering. Um, but if you wanna keep your lawn green throughout the season, uh, you really will need to do some watering when we get droughty. And uh, they say about an inch and a half per week is the minimum to keep a lawn green. And that can be measured as easy by putting as easy as putting a rain gauge in your lawn, or just take like a tuna can. A tuna can is about an inch and a half uh, in, in height, and you just leave that out in your lawn when you run your irrigation system. And when you fill that that tuna can full, you've probably given enough water for that for that uh, lawn to have a have a decent soak uh, for the week. And I'm really thinking only watering like once, giving a good soak once or twice a week. Um, and I've got up here, if you water, water deeply and frequently, and that's kind of an odd statement. Uh, I know so many people have irrigation systems, they want it to come on every night for like one hour. And no, I, I don't really like that. What we want to do is when we water, we're going to give our lawn a really good soak so that the water penetrates down six to eight inches. And then we're going to let it uh, dry out a bit. And by letting it dry out, the surface will dry out, but the roots will kind of start reaching down for, for moisture. Uh, but at a certain point when we're starting to dry out, then we're going to come back and we're going to give it another deep watering, then let it kind of dry out. Not to the point that it's yellowing, though. Uh, so deeply and frequently avoid frequent light waterings. When you water, give it a good soak. And one thing we can do after watering to kind of see how deep it's penetrated is uh, do a little bit of monitoring. And this is something I do here a lot at the garden. Uh, and it can serve a number of purposes. I'll take a knife out and I'll, I'll cut a little triangle out, almost like you're cutting an eye in a pumpkin, pop it out. And I can look here and I can see, boy, I've got moisture going all the way down. So it's got a decent watering three plus inches. I can also look here, here's the grass itself. Look at the bottom, I can see roots uh, going three plus inches. So I can see how deep the rooting is and that's looking good. I can also inspect for thatch and thatch is the development of, uh, organic material at the top here. Remember, if we're using a mulching mower, it can start to develop a little bit of thatch and uh, generally not a concern until we're going a half to three quarters of an inch. And this isn't bad at all. If it gets real deep, then we probably have an indication to aerate. Generally not gonna be a problem. 
Uh, sometimes if we're developing a lot of thatch, it's telling us we're doing something wrong, like maybe fertilizing too, mu too much. Uh, and then here's an example of a couple more samples I've taken. You see the rooting down here, nice rooting at the bottom. Oh, a little bit of thatch developing there. This is actually tall fescue. This is bluegrass. And these, I think, are some fine fescues from some shade tolerant areas. But I think it's important you go out every once in a while, walk around your lawn, take a look at it, see how it's looking. Maybe go grab a, a knife and cut one of these eyes out and see how deep your rooting is, man. You really want your rooting to go uh, like a good four inches, check for your thatch, and then also see when you do water, whether you've given it a good a good drink or not. Because when you do water, you want to give it a really a good soak and then let it kind of dry out again. Uh, but again, if you want to not water at all, uh, you'll probably be just just fine. Your lawn may go totally on the yellow side, but when, when rain returns, it'll, it'll, it'll come back. Weed control. And again, I think we're going to primarily manage our weeds through having a very vigorous lawn that will start to outcompete the weeds, but you're not going to get all out of all the weeds by just doing the cultural things right. Maybe have some tolerance, uh, uh, accept a, a certain level of weeds. I certainly do at home. Uh, try a mechanical weed remover, and I'm going to show you some pictures of that in a moment. Or consider doing a little bit of uh, herbicide spraying through something we call spot spraying. Uh, that, that'll help you get uh, really control some of your troublesome weeds and not let things get out of control. And I, once a year, I'll do a little bit of spot spraying, uh, uh, but I really rely on the, 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 the cultural things. Um, I think it's a little bit important to kind of understand, know what some of your primary weeds are so you can identify them. I think everyone knows dandelions, and dandelions are actually a perennial plant. Uh, and when you have the first bloom in the spring, those are all dandelions that were left from last fall that are, 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 are blooming. Uh, ground ivy or creeping charlie is another real difficult one. I know it's in, in my yard. And then violets are another real, real difficult one. But we've got a lot of different weeds. Uh, that, that can kind of kind of creep up on us and it's kind of interesting to know know some of your common common lawn weeds. Um, here is a mechanical device to, to uh, pull weeds and there's a number of different ones you need to have a certain amount of moisture in your lawn before these uh, pro these devices can be successful. Uh, this one here is, is called a weed popper and uh, I first learned about it when I heard uh, noise in my neighbor's yard I kept hearing this popping sound. And I went over and Joe, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm working on the dandelions. And uh, he, uh, I really doubted this product, but I went and watched him use it. And if you really get the technique right, you can jab this down uh, around the dandelion and get that tap root, pull it out, and then you hit this little button and it pops it out and makes a nice clicking sound. Uh, kind of tedious to do, but if you have the time and, and the will, uh, some of these devices can work, but you need to have the soil a little bit on the moist side and have patience. Um, again, we're going to focus on the cultural things to have a very vigorous lawn, but we're still going to have a few weeds pop up and you don't want them to get out of control. So this is what I do at home and this is what we do here at the Chicago Botanic Garden. We will go out in certain areas and do a little bit of something called spot spraying where we're going to go out with a small canister and target weeds individually. We're never spraying entire lawn areas. It's just really not necessary and kind of do this as needed. Once a year, I'll, I'll use one of these units, walk around my yard just to kind of keep the weeds back. Otherwise, I've always got a low level of weeds and they really don't, don't bother me very much. Um, if you do decide, decide to do some of this spot spraying, get the little hand sprayer, uh, but be sure and pick your product carefully. And there are products like this Weed Begone and there are different brand names that uh, basically this is a product that will not harm the lawn, but will kill the weeds. Be careful not to pick one like this product here that's a, 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 a pretty much kills everything, like sort of like a Roundup. Oh, of course, I'm watching my neighbors. I had my neighbor a couple of years ago. He bought the wrong product. He went out and spot sprayed like this, and he was using a product that was more like Roundup. And let's just say he was at the hardware store buying sod within a couple of weeks. He'd done some real, real damage. Um, but by, by spot spraying, rather than blanket spraying, we can really use a lot less herbicide. We did a study back some years ago, and we looked at a, a quarter acre section of, of lawn, and we found that if we did blanket applications, uh, three to four per year, we're spraying about 140 gallons worth of herbicide, and we can keep the lawn looking pretty much weed free, but we can keep it just as weed free by going out and doing this walk around spot spray using a tremendous amount less herbicide. We're able to with 12 gallons in a whole season, keep a lawn area pretty much weed free. 140, 
to 12 gallons, huge reduction, huge reduction. And that's kind of what an integrated program is, 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 is about. Uh, an organic program would be not using this at all. An integrated program would be using it with great sensitivity towards the environment. So again, uh, ra rather than doing conventional blanket application, focusing on cultural practices with a little bit of spot spraying, you can have a pretty darn weed-free lawn with only a, using a very small amount of, of herbicide if you wanted to make, make that, that, that choice. Um, also, we've got uh, different uh, grasses that tend to be uh, uh, weedy grasses or, or weeds as well. And uh, there's a number of different ones. I know I've got at least three of these at home, but pretty much crabgrass is the one we're always concerned about. And crabgrass is actually an, an annual. And here's a crabgrass plant here, uh, meaning, when it, meaning when it, annual, it does not live through the winter. Uh, so right now here is, this is a crabgrass plant. This is probably um, mid, mid summer and it's starting to develop. And right here are seed spikes coming out. Something that's called tillers. And if we let this go to seed, then we're set ourselves up, ne up next year for having a crabgrass problem. There's actually a liquid spray we can buy real similar that we can do spot spraying at this point to kill it. Or if you go out just before these seeds are released, you can grab that uh, crabgrass plant and take a knife and just cut it off. You don't even need to get weeds. You don't even need to get roots and it won't come back. Um, and then th again, and when we get to fall, this dies off with the very first frost. Um, again, but this is a very opportunistic, uh, crabgrass is very opportunistic and will really focus on areas you love your lawn that aren't doing well, that are under stress. And if we have a real vigorous lawn, even if we've got some seed in there, uh, the vigorous lawn will almost choke this out. So uh, we can go, go at it that way, focusing on, again, uh, the cultural practice and getting a vigorous lawn. But like I say, there is a, uh, uh, a spray you can buy where you could do the same sort of spot spray, but mix up a product specifically for crabgrass. And also for crabgrass, there are some products called pre-emergence, uh, but you'd apply those with a spreader and you'd apply that to your entire yard in the, in the spring that will deter these seeds from, from germinating. Might be an option if you've had a really bad year for crabgrass, but again, I hate to be applying those products over an entire yard when crabgrass uh, may only be in a, a small, small area. Uh, there is one organic pre-emergent out there. It's called corn gluten that you can apply to your lawn uh, and it deters a lot of the crabgrass seeds from germinating, uh, but I haven't found it to be real successful uh, at, at, at controlling them. So I think of all of our, our annual grasses, crabgrass is probably the one that we need to be a little bit concerned about. Um, Lawn diseases, I'm not going to spend but a moment on. Uh, golf course industry, they worry about them a lot, but they're mowing their lawn short, they're stressing it out, they're overwatering, uh, promoting. But uh, I think for us, you may see some of these little patchy things happen in your lawn, but uh, they, they come and they go. And if you were to look in the very morning, this is the start of dollar spot. You can actually see this called mycelium. It's actually fungal growth. Uh, but you know, generally it doesn't go very far weather conditions change and these lawn diseases come and go. So I don't think it's anything for you to be too worried about. Uh, so we got weeds, we've got diseases, and we also have some insect problems. And there's a lot of different insects that can attack lawns. I really have only dealt with three of these aphids, sod webworm, and white grub. And I think this is the, probably the only one you guys are gonna be really concerned about. Um, and white grubs can actually do a, a good bit of damage to your, to your lawn, but again, if we're maintaining our lawn proper and it's very vigorous and thick, uh, the damage they can do will be a lot less than, than a lawn that's not doing real, real well. So here's a lawn that's been attacked uh, by grubs and this really, you don't see this till very late, late summer. Uh, here's the grub itself. Uh, this grub is actually the larva of a, a June beetle, Japanese beetle or a white chafer. These are the beetles you see flying around starting in late June into July. They mate, they lay eggs, eggs hatch, and then these grubs start chewing on the uh, uh, roots of your lawn. And I could actually go to this and probably pull it back like a carpet. A lot of times you get this appearance, but uh, Mr. Skunk finds this like prime rib. So he goes and rips up the lawn and eats all these guys. Uh, a lot of folks will go in when this happens and rake it all up and then they got this big bare spot. Here at the garden when we have this happen, my turf technician will go out and he'll throw a few handfuls of seed down Then he'll take all these ripped up pieces and they're actually almost like pieces of sod. He'll put them back, step them down, we'll water and generally next spring we don't even remember it even happened. 
Um, there are products you can apply to your lawn to control grubs if you've had a series at a history of grubs. But again, this is an insecticide you would apply to your lawn probably via your spreader uh, in uh, probably late June or early July, and it'll protect it for the whole season. But again, uh, you're applying an insecticide uh, to your to your entire lawn that I don't think is always really necessary. Some years are worse than others for, 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 for grubs, but I would not think of applying an insecticide to your lawn unless you had some serious problems the year before. But even here at the garden, we've backed off to the point that we're not even applying that uh, anymore. When we have this sort of situation, we just kind of deal with it. I find lawns to be very resilient. And even though this looks horrible, we could get this to bounce back and probably by early summer next year, you'd never know it even happened without uh, having to like resod or do any, any major, major renovation. And then when it does come, come, come for renovation, it's good to know what kind of lawn you have so you can choose the right seed. But again, I think most of you are gonna have a bluegrass lawn. And then we've got a choice of buying seed or, 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 or sod and not many people think about the sod option. But I'm finding nowadays pretty much all the home centers seem to carry sod and it's not real expensive and you can do a real quick fix by buying a, a, a few, few little rolls of, of, of sod. And then uh, also it's, uh, buying seed is something that would really, really, if you wanna do some renovation and really uh, the best time to renovate a lawn would probably be uh, early fall or very late, late spring. And I think early fall is one of the best times, but if you're gonna put down seed, you gotta make sure that the seed will germinate and come up uh, and handle a couple of mowings before we've had our first frost. So I really say your window for seeding is early September. And when you're choosing a seed, uh, choose, choose a seed to match your lawn. And uh, okay, here's a sunny mix, dense mix, sunshade. Oh, how do they get a sunshade? Well, they just take half that half that, mix it together, and whichever does the best will dominate. So a sunny mix would be matching what you have in your lawn. So you'd be buying a, a blue blue rye blend. Uh, if, if you're getting a shady mix, it's gonna be some, some fine, fine fescues, uh, but you can always flip the bag over and look at the list of exactly what's in it. And notice one, two, three, four, five Kentucky bluegrasses, and I got an equal number of perennial rye grasses. Why not just choose one? It's nice to have a, a, a blend of bluegrasses and a blend of perennial rye, and these two together are, 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 are a mix. And these have all been, uh, have different attributes like this one that says Liberty might be really good for being dark green. This one is very aggressive. This one's disease retardant. They all have different virtues that work well in, in, in synergy together. Uh, and the more expensive uh, grass seeds are gonna have this sort of a mix and blend together. Uh, more inexpensive ones might just have one Kentucky bluegrass or just one perennial rye. And I think it's important to go ahead and spend a few extra bucks to get uh, uh, get some 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 decent seed. Uh, and uh, again, look to what's on it, not, not that it's endorsed by a, a famous uh, baseball player. Um, and then sod is another option that you can pretty much do any time of year. Just whatever the bad area or lawn is, you kind of uh, will cut it out into a square so the sod will go right in. Definitely work the soil lightly uh, down to about uh, uh, four to six inches, then put your sod down. Uh, and then I, I'm not gonna go over it today, but the watering and uh, uh, after seeding or sodding is real, real important, some of the aftercare. But I'm gonna give you a, a, a resource uh, that you can go to to find more information on, on doing this. You can only do so much in, in an hour here today. Uh, but what I'm hoping I'm doing today is kind of simplifying things for you. You don't need to have uh, 20 bags of lawn clippings at the, at the end of your driveway every, every week. Use the mulching mower, raise that mowing height, keep a sharp blade, um, try and, and also if you're losing the battle, maybe consider planting a ground cover or wood chipping under a, 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 a tree and uh, Hopefully you don't need to donate every Sunday of the summer to, to taking care of your lawn and we can kind of simplify it and at the same time be a little more sensitive to the environment. Um, for some real clear, simple recommendations on lawn care, a uh, University of Illinois has a, uh, a webpage called Lawn Talk and you can just uh, do a search uh, uh, University of Illinois Extension Lawn Talk and go to it and they'll have information on selecting lawns, uh, uh, maintenance, weed control, and just uh, 
uh, some really good recommendations in there. So some of the things I've talked about today, you want to look a little, little further on. I think this will be a really a great resource uh, for you. And uh, again, I, I'm used to talking more so with people face to face and kind of taking questions. So uh, hopefully I haven't bored you too much. Hopefully you've got some ideas. Spring is just around the corner, almost time to get your lawnmower out and make sure that uh, it's working well. Uh, you've got a nice sharp blade ready to go that is nice and clean. Maybe you want to consider getting a mulching mower and starting off the season with, with, with a nice mulching mower uh, and uh, uh, don't, don't struggle with it. So I think I'm going to close it here and I think we'll attempt to see if we can't uh, uh, take a few questions, which you would uh, go ahead and type in and Grace will field them and uh, shoot them to me and we'll try and take a couple questions right now. So if anyone has any questions they wanna, 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 wanna type in, let's, let's give it a try. We do have a few questions and, and uh, I encourage anyone who's out there, um, you can put them either into Q&A or into chat, either one, and I'd be happy to ask them on your behalf. Um, first question up is, um, what do you think of liquid aeration products? Liquid aeration products. Um, I am not sure exactly what he means by liquid aeration products. I know there is a machine that you can actually go over a lawn with that rather than pulling cores will actually shoot water straight downward and, and in spurts and will actually fracture the soil at the same time. And I think those can have great benefit, but it's a very unique piece of equipment that I don't think many folks would, would, would have. If, if that's if that's what I'm thinking he's talking about. So um, it's just another way of aeration with uh, high pressure water. And I think some of the sports fields use some of that, that technique, but I don't think it's something that uh, many homeowners would have. Maybe some of the upscale landscape companies may have, have that device, but it's not, it's not real, real, real common. Uh, but I, I think uh, it would be something that would probably work, work pretty well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bernie wants to know um, what you might recommend for controlling lesser celandine. Boy, <laughs> um, we're dealing with that here at the garden. It's that lovely yellow flower we see early in the, in the, in the, in the springtime then it kind of fades away. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, there's two approaches is if it's not a big patch you get out there very carefully and kind of dig it up carefully, getting all the roots and all. Um, we've been going, we've been doing that, and in some areas we've been trying uh, some different herbicides. Uh, we've uh, actually experimented with a few different ones. This is just a really nasty weed that should be controlled. Uh, we've uh, had a little bit of success with glyphosate Roundup, but not real great. We've actually found uh, product. Uh, uh, Garlon seems to work work pretty pretty well. Um, uh, and we've been trying different things, but I, I think to really get rid of it, uh, and, and, and I'm not sure whether you're talking, she's talking about a, a lawn situation or a bed situation. If it's a lawn situation, um, some repeated sprays with one of the selective herbicides uh, that you could, you could get that I was showing you, they'd mix in your container. And generally those are 2,4-D, MCP and dicamba in combination. And one, one, one hit probably won't do it, uh, but a couple hits, two to three hits probably would. And it's really important to get on it early. Don't, don't wait too long on, on it. When it's past flowering, it's even more hard to control. But uh, uh, that was a real interesting question because it's a, it's a new evasive weed that we've been dealing with here, here, at the, here at the garden. Really hard to control, but important to control. Good luck, yep. <laughs> everybody. Um, uh, next question up, thank you. Um, next question up is from Howard who says, I have largish areas of, of clover and bent grass. What would you, how would you recommend that I treat these? Okay, we've got two different ones. Uh, clover, I actually meant to talk about clover a little bit. Um, clover, uh, when, many years ago, and we're actually getting back, having a full swing around, when you would buy grass seed many years ago, clover was commonly in the grass mixes because clover is a legume and actually fixes nitrogen in its root zone. 
Uh, so it's actually fertilizing the lawn as, as well as being uh, an interesting plant. To, and then over time, we've gone to these pristine lawns that we want completely weed free. Now I'm starting to see people starting to use clover again. And matter of fact, there's a section of the Botanic Garden where we're going to be actually overseeding a lawn area with something called micro clover uh, with our hopes that it's going to help invigorate the lawn. And uh, actually, it's a very sustainable way because it's fixing nitrogen, actually feeding the lawn. But to get rid of clover, uh, you could use one of the selective herbicides that I've talked about, similar to spot spraying. Uh, some of those are very effective on getting rid of clover. Um, creeping bent grass is a, a different story. Um, very, very difficult to get rid of, especially in a lawn. There really aren't any selective products. Uh, there, there's one that's really difficult to use. Um, for, for creeping bent grass, unfortunately, I think you need to use uh, Roundup, kill the entire area, and then reseed or resod it. It's, it's that hard to get rid of. Uh, being that the Botanic Garden is next to a golf course, we have a lot of spots where it's gotten in, into our lawn, and uh, we found it very, very difficult to get, get away. In that picture earlier where I showed someone putting down sod, that was an area where we had creeping bent grass in the Rose Garden, that we used Roundup to kill a little section and then we resodded it. So uh, bent grass is very difficult to get rid of. The clover you can get rid of, shouldn't be too difficult. Okay, thank you. Um, Jane says, says, hi, the only weed that really bothers me are the wild violets and buttercups. Last year I started spraying with strong vinegar, like 45%, any other suggestions? Yeah, the vinegar works as a, as a nice herbicide. It's non-selective though, so wherever you're going to spray that, uh, it's going to probably burn what you've what you sprayed, um, uh, and also will kill the grass as, as well. And you may sometimes maybe get more of a surface burn off and allow the weed to 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 to, to come back. And the weeds you mentioned are some real troublesome one. And even with a selective herbicide, one spray probably isn't going to do it. It's probably going to take a, a few different sprays. But I think. Uh, uh, maybe do some of the some of the spot spraying. Uh, I, I think even a vigorous lawn for some of the troublesome weeds uh, may not out com compete them. So those are, those are some really there are a few really tough weeds. I know at home I fight creeping Charlie and and the violets and I uh, knock them back, but I end up losing the battle. But I am I'm not I'm not sold on the fact that I, I want a hundred percent weed free lawn. I want a tidy lawn. So I, th I think de determining. What, what's acceptable in your lawn and what's not. I think having a few weeds, but then again, the violets can really get, get going and get out of control. Um, and there are also some other selective herbicides that aren't available for homeowners that people in the landscape industry have available to them where one spray would, would knock them out. So there's always the thought that maybe for a, a, a one-time rescue application that you may bring in a lawn care company for one application and then dismiss them. But then again, it sounds like you're on the organic side. I think you're using the, 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 the vinegar, which is a nice burn-off product. But I think you're still going to have, have a bit of, bit of trouble with, with those, those violets. Thanks. Um, Candace wants to know, if you use a real mower, is the height setting the same? And are there any other considerations to keep in mind? Yeah, I think on a real mower, to be successful, you can't go real high. They don't even allow you to set them real, real, real high, but I would probably go with the, the highest setting, and uh, real mowers are really the type that uh, uh, all golf courses use real mowers on the greens, a real fine one. They also use real mowers on most of the fairways because they mow so short. Uh, I know a lot of folks have the more of the maybe the, the, the city lots that aren't so small and the real mowers are kind of nice things to use, but I definitely set it at the, at the, at the highest setting and keep it as sharp as possible. And I know you need to take it somewhere to have that sharpening done, but by keeping that real mower really sharp, uh, it'll allow it to do better at that highest setting. But I, I know you're not gonna be able to get anywhere near three, three and a half inches, but uh, set it at its highest setting and it actually, uh, um, make it actually they actually mow really well, make really nice, 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 nice cuts, and certainly environmentally friendly too. No emissions there, other than other than other than your own breath and your own sweat. So I commend you. Um, thanks. Here's somebody, Diane, who says, "My lawn is rutted and looks terrible. Squirrels are out there eating a lot. Also skunks. Um, what about True Green Company?" And I don't quite understand the question, but you probably do. 
Well, I think he's saying his lawn's looking a, a, a little, little bit rough. Um, and if your lawn is getting a little bit pitted, there's something you can do called top dressing where you would go out and very lightly throw some nice soil across your lawn to kind of smooth things out. Not enough to smother your lawn, lawn out though. And you can kind of, uh, uh, kind of kind of help smooth out your lawn there yes squirrels are doing a lot of activity and i think your lawn kind of goes through a progression a certain time times times a year where it's not going to look as well we're getting ready for spring with lots of rain and like i say lawns tend to be really resilient as uh quite often i'll look at leave my home lawn like oh boy this is really getting bad then all of a sudden we'll have uh, a lot of nice rain uh, and better conditions then it's like oh it's looking for looking pretty 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 good um, then when he mentioned Trugan, I think he's just talking about uh, different lawn care companies is one better than, than an, another. And I really can't comment on that. A lot of them sell very similar services. Uh, they'll come out, they'll keep your lawn looking good, but a lot of them are going to sell you a program. We're going to visit your site four to five times a year. They're going to fertilize. They're going to spray corner to corner, edge to edge. They'll keep it looking good. I will say there are some companies out there that are offering organic options for lawn care. Uh, but they tend to be a little bit more expensive and they're going to explain to you uh, uh, certain expectations that you just, you're just you just not going to be able to achieve a certain type of lawn by going all, all organic. You need to uh, have some, 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 some tolerance. And we do have some areas at the Botanic Garden where we're uh, all organic and you go out there and uh, especially after last year, we're a little bit on the weedy side. So it's an organic lawn care program, really staying organic and wanting to keep a lawn weed free. Uh, those two things kind of don't go together. You need to have some tolerance for a certain level of weeds if you really want to go all organic. And that's why I kind of talk about a hybrid program where we're going to uh, do our cultural things right, uh, kind of use an organic fertilizer. But if we really want to deal with some of these real difficult weeds, maybe just a little bit of spot spraying. Again, this is our rose garden lawn and this is the lawn that we've measured. 140 gallons if we spray this lawn four times in a season. Uh, we don't do that. My technician goes out and walks it once a month. We use more like 12 gallons an entire season. So a huge reduction, but we do have some input. But this is one of our highest level lawns at the Chicago Botanic Garden that we're managing through this hybrid program. And uh, compared to conventional, we're using very, very small amount of synthetic products here. Organic fertilizer, just a teeny bit of spraying, and it looks awesome. It really does. Uh, thank you. Um, David wants to know, um, is there a preferred chemical for overall grub control? For overall what control? Grub control. Grub control. There's a couple different products. Um, uh, and I think there, again, I'm not, I'm not saying one brand is another, but one of the most conventional ones is called GrubX out there. And I can't think of the active ingredient in there, but it actually covers uh, grubs and sod webworm. And it's something you'd apply to your entire lawn in say uh, uh, early July or, or mid June, and you won't have any insect problems for the, for the rest of the year. And then uh, I know the product that used to use in there was uh, I made a cloper, which is a neonicotinoid. They've gone away from that, and that would take care of your grubs, but not the not the sod webworm. Uh, but I, I think think uh, there are some pro some granular products out there that they're, they're 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 highly effective. But again, you're applying that insecticide to 100% of your lawn, and I think kind of what we're talking about today is kind of going on the organic side. And here at the garden, we've gone out, we, we, we used to apply to all of our level one lawn areas, like the one we're looking at is we used to apply grub control. We've stopped doing that. We understand that uh, uh, every few years, we might have a grub problem. We might have some things ripped up, but uh, we'll kind of work through uh, some, some uh, uh, reseeding and things and, and kind of avoid making the application. But if you really want to be grub free, there are some products that are highly effective that you can apply to your lawn. Excellent, thank you. Um, Jane has a question. Um, what do you do when crabgrass takes over in the middle of the summer on a patch that doesn't currently have grass? Would grass seed germinate in the middle of the summer or do or just do your best to kill the crabgrass and wait till the fall to plant seed? Yeah, you're really not gonna be real successful with, with putting seed down in mid midsummer. It's just too hot and it's hard to keep up with the watering. And I think for that year, it's like, okay, crabgrass has happened. Um, you can go in and by hand cut out the crabgrass. Just don't want to, the key is just don't let that crabgrass go to seed. 
Um, there's a liquid product you can uh, you can buy and you can spray to the crabgrass that will kill the crabgrass but won't hurt the lawn. Uh, and then I would wait till, uh, um, and then in early September, I'd kind of work through that area, make sure the crabgrass doesn't go to seed, uh, or, or rake through it and kind of get all the remnants of the crabgrass out. And then in, in early September, I would seed the area and uh, uh, maybe consider for just that little area, possibly a pre-emergent the next year, not for your whole yard, but maybe just for that area, or or consider just watching that area and considering that liquids having some liquid spray for crabgrass uh, and not letting it get 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 too large. Okay, thank you. Um, can we do a couple more questions? Sure. You have time. Okay. Um, I think you've already mentioned um, a natural weed control spray, but uh, if you could, if you could name it again. Um, yeah, no, this is actually great to kind of talk about again, because when we're talking about going organic, uh, which is all the cultural things, we've got organic fertilizers, but when it comes to weed control, there are no organic selective post-emergent uh, herbicides. So for that dandelion, I don't have any organic products I can apply to make that uh, weed go away. If someone invents one, they're going to really uh, 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 be a millionaire really, really quick. Um, but there are some, there is a product that is a pre-emergent that can be applied, will deter crabgrass and other weeds that are annuals that have put seed down in your lawn, and it's called corn gluten. And can you say that again? Corn? Corn, corn gluten. Okay. And uh, it's a byproduct of the corn industry, and you can buy this as a granular product, and you apply it to your lawn in uh, early spring. Timing is really important. You need to get this down before seeds germinate. Uh, the, the only kind of kicker, I haven't seen great results in it, and actually corn gluten is an organic fertilizer as well, and to get enough pre-emergent activity to deter the weed seeds are actually almost over fertilizing your lawn at the same time. Uh, so we need to be a little bit careful about using and timing is, is, is essential, but uh, you can find a lot of information online on, on, on corn gluten and uh, there are a number of sources you can find to purchase corn, corn gluten and it's used in lawn care as a pre-emergent that will deter a lot of different types of seeds from, from germinating. Uh, don't think you're going to put it down and uh, uh, it's going to fix all your problems. And you're not going to have any weed seeds germinating, but it, it will help to deter them a lot. But again, I've played around with it. I haven't had great luck with it, but uh, it's one of the only uh, organic herbicides out there. And again, it won't do anything for weeds that are already there. It will would be applied very early spring uh, and it will deter weed seeds from, from germinating to a certain degree. Excellent. Good thing everyone here is thinking ahead early in the season because I'm going to start thinking uh, we're getting the 60s next week. Uh, oh, better better act fast this week. Yeah, yeah. The season will be upon us shortly. Right. Uh, Howard wants to know, do you recommend soil testing of lawns? Certainly do for vegetable beds and like other other beds. Not so much for lawns. I think in our area you're going to find uh, some consistencies, uh, uh, and I, 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 I think you're, 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 as far as choosing, a lot of times we will use uh, uh, soil tests to help us choose fertilizer, whether we need to fertilize or not. I've just kind of found in our area that our soils tend to be high in phosphorus, potassium, and we want to keep those low when we're buying a fertilizer, but uh, uh, might be worth doing if he hasn't done it before. A uh, soil sample can be sent out and analyzed for uh, under $20, and it'll tell you how much of the different nutrients are in the soil. And something I like to do with the soil test is do something called a particle size analysis, PSA, and that will tell you how much sand, silt, and clay you have in your soil. And if you have a real high percentage of clay, uh, that means your, your soil can get compacted easy and maybe an indication that you may want to do some more core aerating. Uh, so uh, if you've never soil tested, maybe something, but I don't think it's quite as essential for lawn as it would be for uh, 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 more so uh, your, 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 your vegetable beds or growing beds. And actually we do a lot of soil testing here at the garden to guide a lot of our, 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 our programs and to guide a lot of our, our, our amendments. Okay, great. Okay, two last questions. Okay. One of them is 
Grubbs again. Um, I'm kind of combining two people's questions. Uh, one person says, sorry if I missed this, but how do you fix the grub situation before putting the rips, ripped up sod back? And then the other, the other question was, um, what do you think of milky spore for controlling grubs? Okay, two good questions. Let me hit the first one first. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, when we go to a lawn that's been ripped up because of uh, uh, skunks digging for the grubs, the skunks have already eliminated the the, the, the grubs for the, for the most part. And then we, for an area that's ripped up, we just throw a handful of seed down. We put down all the pieces of the puzzle back together and kind of water it in. And yeah, we'll have some loss, but at the same time we've uh, put some seed down and generally this damage is happening in early September, which is the optimal time for putting down seed. Uh, in a situation where the skunks didn't rip it up and the grubs still remain there. Yeah, we may have some lawn yellowing, we may have some kind of dead spots. Uh, but uh, the grubs have done most of their feeding and damage by, by fall. As soon as we get cold weather, the grubs that are any grubs that are left will go downward uh, for overwintering. And then in the spring, they come up and they do very, very little feeding in the springtime. So uh, once we get to that point, uh, I don't think we need to worry about the grubs too much. I know a lot of folks will see the grubs in the fall and run out and start applying insecticides to their lawn. But the grubs have already done all the damage and they're, they've already at the end of their uh, grub lifespan to some degree, and I just don't think that's 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 warranted. Um, and then the the second question was about another type of grub control in an organic program. It's called the uh, milky spore disease or uh, 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 Bacillus pompiliae. Uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a bacterial product that you can apply to your lawn, and it will infect the grubs and will kill the grubs. And as the grubs die. That, uh, that product will actually go into the soils and inoculate the soil so it's perpetual. Um, the only kind of kicker is uh, this Bacillus pompiliae or the milky spore disease is only effective on Japanese beetle grubs. And what we're finding in the lawn is we have three different types of grubs. Japanese beetles are only one of the three. The other two are uh, June beetles and, and, and chafers, which the, the, the uh, um, a milky spore is not effective on at all. And okay, here's a really fun one for you. So if you wanna know whether you have Japanese beetle grubs or one of the other grubs, you need to take one of the grubs, look at it very closely with a hand lens or under the microscope. Uh, and basically you're gonna look at its butt. And if the hairs on the butt are in a V, v pattern, it's Japanese beetle. If they're in straight lines, it's probably one of the other ones. And I don't think I see many of you doing that. So just be aware if you use milky spore, it's gonna probably knock back maybe uh, some of your grubs, but uh, I don't think it's a cure all because a lot of your grubs are not gonna be uh, 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 hit by th this product that only affects grubs that are from Japanese beetles. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, that was, that was interesting. Um, okay, last kind of doubleheader question. Um, Linda asks two questions about mowing. Uh, one, what do you think of the giant mower, mowers that landscapers use? And two, how late in the year should you stop mowing? And that'll be our last question then. Okay, um, the ones the landscapers use, uh, uh, they're meant for them to get on your property and off your property pretty quickly. Quick. They have different types. A lot of them, they stand on and they ride. Um, I don't think, uh, I think a lot of them, but it's just kind of in my mind, are they collecting the clippings or returning them? Is it a true multi-mower? Most of them, they kind of put into baskets and kind of, kind of haul away. Uh, I'm not sure many of them use multi-mowers. I'm sure there might, 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 might be some. Uh, and I think they do a good job of mowing. I think they're, they tend to Kind of keep their mowers in good shape and also keep their blades sharp so at least that's good uh good question to ask two things when having someone come in from outside your property to mow would be um uh one thing making sure that mowing height is uh what you want it to be and not too short and then also uh, i've seen i've had certain i've do some consulting on the side and i've gone to people who have like some bent grass problems only to find out that uh the, the client that this person was at, how, houses they were at before was mowing a lawn that was right next to a golf course. Then they came and mowed in their yard and uh, the mower deck wasn't completely clean. So that's how some of the weed problems get spread around. Even disease problems can get spread around, but the, we're getting into the kind of minutia here, but it, it can, can happen. Um, 
What was the second half of this? The second half of the question is how late in the year should you stop mowing? Um, you're going to mow as long as the grass is still still growing. One thing you don't want to do is leave the lawn at the end of the year on the shaggy side or you can uh, possibly encourage things like meadow voles to be, be nesting. But at the same time, you don't want to make the last mowing like a real short mowing either. But uh, uh, we, we, you, you can, you'll, you'll, you, so there's no set date on when to, when to stop mowing. It's kind of when your grass kind of shuts down and kind of stops, stops growing. Okay. And that's a long way away. That's a long ways away. But I'm looking forward to some green shortly, though. Thank you so much. Um, I, I would guess that everybody here has learned a lot today. And yeah, I was happy to do this. And I just want to make sure everyone understands that the Chicago Botanic is here for you to all to come and enjoy. And we're actually an educational resource for you. We've got a plant information service. You can call with questions. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the School of Botanic Garden gets back going this year so you can come and take courses and really look for us a place to, uh, to come, and come and visit and relax. And I think we all need a little bit of that. But if you have any other questions on lawn care, we're certainly a resource for you here at the, at the Botanic Garden. And also that one resource I gave you, that webpage can be very helpful as well. Are you referring to University of Illinois Extension? Yeah, so, yeah. What is it's, it's, not, it's not all organic, but it's got some really good information in it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you everyone for participating. And thank you very much, Mr. Tiddens, for sharing your wisdom. Thank you. So long, everyone.